These machines travel millions of miles, explore distant worlds, and reveal the secrets of the universe. But who builds them? Who dreams them up? And more importantly, how do you learn to design something that has to work millions of kilometers from home? Hey everyone, I'm John Reed, host of Learn to Stargaze here on YouTube and author of the Things to See with the Telescope series. But during the past three and a half years, I've been doing a remote master's program in space systems engineering from Johns Hopkins University. This program is extremely popular in the aerospace industry and every conference I go to seems to be populated with its graduates. So in this video, I'm going to cover exactly what the program is, what material is covered in each class, how to get in, and how much it costs. Now this video is not sponsored, I'm just telling it like it is. This is Learn to Stargaze. So what's so special about Johns Hopkins and why would you want to take a space degree from this particular institution? Well, Johns Hopkins is a private research space university located in Baltimore, about an hour's drive from Washington, D.C. Under the Johns Hopkins banner, it's primarily known for its biomedical research facilities. But its Laurel, Maryland campus is the home of the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, or APL. Now, APL can be thought of as East Coast JPL. It's where many of NASA's deep space missions are developed, and it's where many of these spacecraft and instruments are actually built. This includes the New Horizons mission to Pluto, the Messenger mission to Mercury, and the Parker Solar Probe mission to the Sun. Diving right in, the Space Systems Engineering program is, well, a master's degree in space systems engineering. But what does that mean? Well, it's sort of two things. First, this program is, at a high level, an introduction to systems engineering, which is sort of like project management combined with high-level engineering design. It's making sure that every major component and subsystem works together as a complete system. But at a detailed level, this program is fundamentally about space systems. This refers primarily to the literal subsystems on board a spacecraft. For example, you'll cover the propulsion system, the avionics subsystem, flight software, and so on, from the component level all the way up to the mission level. The Space Systems Engineering Master's degree is course-based, which means there's no theses to defend and there's no big paper that spans the entire program. Each course is self-contained, and you have to take 10 courses. That's pretty much it. Now, five of those courses are known as the core courses. These are mandatory, and one of those core courses will include what they call a capstone project, which I'll cover in a moment. The five remaining courses are electives that you get to choose, and they seem to be adding new courses all the time. Now, both the core courses and the electives are pretty much all structured in the exact same way. Content is accessed through web-based software called Canvas. Each course is generally broken down into about 14 weekly modules with a term project module. Each module generally contains the following. First, weekly readings, usually a couple of hours worth. Then there's the video lectures. I'd estimate that there's about three hours of lecture per weekly module, but these typically take me a bit longer to work through as I'm constantly stopping to take notes. There's also a self-guided quiz to check your understanding. This is followed by a weekly assignment, which can take anywhere from a few hours to a few days to complete. You also have to actively participate in weekly discussion groups with your fellow classmates. These usually require a bit of research as well so that you actually know what you're talking about. For me, these require about an hour of effort per week. Then there's office hours. This, I believe, is where you really get your money's worth in this program. The course instructors are at the top of their field. They know their stuff. And not many students come to office hours, so 90% of the time, you get one-on-one -on -one interaction with the instructor. I generally use this time to review my completed assignments ahead of submission to make sure I'm not missing anything important. But it's also a great time to dive deeper into the specifics of the particular engineering field and even get some career advice. Now for the term projects, which tend to build up as the semester progresses, you'll typically form a team and meet about once a week to connect on your individual deliverables, consolidating those deliverables into a cohesive mission analysis. Now let's go over the five core courses. The first class you'll take is Systems Engineering for Space. Now I thought this was the least interesting class, which I actually think is a good thing because the program only gets more fun from then on. The key takeaway from this course is the Systems Engineering method, which is really a mindset. This is a four-step cycle that repeats as a systems engineer goes about their work. Now the four-step cycle is requirements analysis, functional definition, physical definition, and design validation. 
The second key takeaway from this course is what are called trade studies. That's where you develop an analytical method to choose between different components or approaches to your system. Now the next two courses are really one big course, and that's Fundamentals of Engineering Space Systems 1, known as FES1, and Fundamentals of Engineering Space Systems 2, known as FES2. This is a one year long course, but it counts as two courses. Now these courses provide a deep dive into each of a satellite's subsystems as well as mission planning, which in this case is primarily orbit determination. The main activity in this course is a team project where you design and present an entire space mission based on a set of requirements. Now I think everyone in the program does the same mission here, and that's to design a constellation of fire detection spacecraft. Basically, you and your team divide up the spacecraft subsystems and complete a robust design of the mission and the spacecraft itself. Your team will do everything from sizing the solar array, sizing the battery, closing the data links with the ground stations, and even designing the spacecraft using computer-aided design, or CAD, along with the instrument fields of view. Now, being a CAD expert is not a requirement for this course, but we were fortunate to have a CAD expert on our team, and he did a fantastic job. Check this out. Shout out to Chase. Well, after FES1 and FES2, you take a survey course called Applications of Space Systems. In this course, you have a different case study each week that dives into a real world space system. Some examples include space debris mitigation, dealing with space weather, or even seeing if a mission to Uranus is possible given a shortage of plutonium for RTGs. Then we get to the capstone of the program. Now, my understanding is that this is changing going forward to a new format where there are multiple projects to choose from. And during my time in the course, some of my classmates, those that worked at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, or APL, were testing a laser communication system as one example of the new format. However, the rest of us did the project, which was developing an integration and test plan for a small satellite. This culminates in an in-person session on Johns Hopkins campus where you actually execute your integration and testing plan while assembling a small spacecraft that, to some extent, actually functions, which was super cool. Now this spacecraft doesn't launch into space or anything like that. It's the integration and test plan that's graded, not how well your satellite does or doesn't perform. Now in addition to the test plan, the capstone included bi-weekly assignments. These projects are primarily an introduction to testing methods based on a series of experiments. But to me, it felt like a course in electrical engineering. Using a microprocessor or an Arduino as a stand-in for a command and data handling system, you have to characterize various components such as thermistors for temperature sensing, servos, stepper motors, potentiometers, and more. And each submission requires an individual experiment of your own design. So for example, one week I built a small solar array that followed a light, and another week I simply taught myself to control a servo over an RF link using my son's RC controller. And yes, if you already have experience with Arduinos or building radio controlled planes, this would be pretty trivial. But really the point of all this was the application of the methods and tools of the systems engineering process, not the experiment itself. So after the capstone is complete, all that's left in the program is to complete five electives. And there are several to choose from. One caveat is mission planning. If you want to take that course, they require that you also take an additional mathematics course. Now, I had actually signed up for this math course over the summer, then dropped it as I didn't feel like spending my summer indoors doing upper level calculus. They gave us a few warm up problems before the class even started, just to make sure we had a good foundation. Here's one of the warm up questions. Just to get your math juices flowing, pause the video here and see how you do. Okay, so since you can choose basically any electives, I simply chose other electives instead. For example, instead of that math course, I took space weather which was a lot of fun. A group project characterized the radiation environment for a habitable base on Jupiter's moon Callisto. And one of my fellow students did a similar project for Earth's moon and actually went to Italy to present her results to the 2024 International Astronomical Congress. My next elective was electro-optics, which was basically about Earth observation satellites. This course familiarizes you with push broom sensors, multispectral and hyperspectral imaging, and how these remote sensing methods are used to gather absolutely immense amounts of data about our planet. And then I took advanced topics in aerospace hardware with the legendary Ann Darren, a NASA division chief at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. She's now at APL. Ann is one of the most beloved instructors at Johns Hopkins. Definitely don't miss any office hours if you take her courses. 
Now this course is largely a survey course that keeps you updated on the latest developments in the industry. Basically, you'll read a lot of papers. The team project in this course is meant to be a publishable engineering paper. Our team created a mission proposal called the Himalaya Explorer, where we proposed to send a mothership along with eight smaller probes to do flybys of each of Jupiter's nine Himalayan group moons, which all orbit Jupiter with a semi-major axis of about 12 million kilometers. Moving on to my final semester here in the program where I am now, I'm currently taking two courses at once, which I can only really do since I've made this semester my full-time job. Hence, so few recent YouTube videos. The two courses are Spacecraft Avionics Systems and Scientific Instruments for Space. Spacecraft Avionics can be thought of as the spacecraft's nervous system. This course teaches you about the spacecraft's brain, the single board computer, and the processor and memory within. There's a heavy focus on the communication buses that allow a spacecraft to interface with its payload and its subsystems. The term project in this class is to completely design the avionics system for a Class A space mission, complete with selecting the single board computer and designing some of the interfaces themselves, including selecting the specific space rated integrated circuits and even defining how the data bits move across the physical medium. Science Instruments for Space is a new course in the program. It gives you an overview of how science instruments are designed to meet the requirements derived from a space mission science objectives. There are two big projects in this course. The first was to complete a DALI proposal. DALI stands for Development and Advancement of Lunar Instruments. The idea is to develop an instrument concept that meets certain requirements. The final team project is to design an instrument based on a set of requirements. Our team was given a magnetometer. After I complete these two final courses, that's it. I'll have completed my master's degree. Okay, so before we go, I'm gonna quickly cover how you get into the program and how much it costs. So admission requires a STEM-related undergraduate degree with a GPA of 3.0 or higher. They'll check for a background in calculus, I think the first three calculus courses, physics, and computer programming. They'll also specify that equivalent work experience is accepted, but even if you don't have the academic requirements, you can still apply and see what happens. If you still don't meet the requirements, the website says that the chair or the program coordinators may interview you to better evaluate your application. Now I did my undergraduate degree in Canada, so I had to have my grades converted to US grades using the website west.org. And this actually wasn't that big of a deal, but it did cost a few hundred dollars. Johns Hopkins advertises that their program is open to anyone worldwide. Now my undergraduate degree in astrophysics more than met all the requirements. I submitted my documents and I was accepted without issue. After the start of your first course, you have five years to complete the program, but most people seem to complete the program in about three years, plus one semester. This is accomplished by taking one class at a time, even during the summer. I've seen some people finish faster, but they seem to have jobs that let them treat this program as their job, because each class is rather time consuming. And I found that for me, it took an average of 20 to 30 hours of work per class per week. As for the cost of the program, after a fellowship that's applied to all students, the 2025 cost is $5,270 per class or $52,700 for the entire program plus $100 for graduation. These amounts do not seem to be taxed. You really don't need to buy books as most of the content is available online via Johns Hopkins e-reserves. As a Johns Hopkins student, you also get a Johns Hopkins email, which gives you access to pretty much every publication and journal out there. Now, one of the big questions about this program is how much of a Johns Hopkins student are you really? I mean, this is an online program, right? Well, here's the thing. When you're in the program, you get a Johns Hopkins student ID, and when you're on campus, you seem to get all the rights and privileges of a regular Johns Hopkins student. You get all the regular Johns Hopkins discounts, and when you graduate, you get all the privileges of a Johns Hopkins alumni. In my time in the program, I barely scratched the surface of all the student benefits that were available to me, including career fairs, meetups, mental health support, and the list goes on. Obviously, you can take advantage of as little or as many of these programs as you'd like. All right, some final thoughts. Would I recommend this program for a recent undergraduate or someone looking to advance in their career? That's a resounding heck yeah. By far the biggest advantage of the program is the quality of the people. Getting to work with professors and fellow students who are on top of their fields was absolutely unbelievable. And I know I've made some lifelong connections who I'll be able to call on without hesitation throughout my future career. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. Now it's back to my regular stargazing programming. So remember, the future is looking up.